welcome everyone to our services this morning. Um, Baxter is off. I believe he's, uh, Jesse, he's preaching in Port Angeles today. So he's a little far away to uh, preach this today. Um, so uh, I'm doing a, a second round of sub, subbing. Uh, Gary did a good job last week uh, in subbing for Baxter. Um, I got a, a quick note from Kathy Hyatt to ask for prayers for Jean Hyatt, who is suffering from cancer at this, at this time, and especially in our need of prayers. Um, this, uh, <clears throat> and let's see, now I have to rethink. Oh, and as Baxter usually does, he, uh, he starts with the plan of salvation, which is both a challenge and an invitation, uh, but reminding people that, uh, uh, and to challenge those who have not yet given their lives to Christ that uh, uh, from, we read from the scripture that we hear the word, we study the word for ourselves, uh, study it with the idea of being convinced that it is true, that we believe it and not believe it just to say we believe it, but come to believe it that we're willing to, are, and are able to commit to the repentance from our sin that we realize that we're enslaved to, the only salvation is through the Lord. Having repented, we confess Jesus' name before men and then are buried with Jesus in the waters of baptism where we come into uh, contact with the uh, redeeming power of Jesus' blood and we rise to walk a new life as uh, committed, uh, committed to our uh, new service to God. And of course, living this life is a big challenge for Christians as we continue to grow in our faith with life's challenges and to grow to put things behind us, the slave that has enslaved us. So now, uh, and just I, again, admonish to that. And, and of course, the congregation here, we're all willing, uh, ready and willing to study uh, with anyone and help them uh, in finding the, uh, finding the path to salvation. Uh, as for a topic this morning, I mentioned to Caleb earlier that I uh, sometimes it's the hardest to come up with a topic, but I have been inspired by a comment he made in the Thessalonians class um, regarding Jonah and Jonah's situation. He's kind of um, sitting on the sidelines, mad at God, kind of petulant because God has done what he thinks should be done. Uh, but it struck me, and of course many times when we... Uh, are preaching any kind of lesson, uh, we think first of what applies to me. <laughs> and thinking with the situation we've had with COVID, uh, and of course with, uh, with some of us who are aging, it seems like there's some new health problem every day, but uh, we can find ourselves being in our isolation, uh, becoming kind of uh, bitter, maybe hypercritical, uh, hypercritical of others and not being uh, as compassionate to others as uh, God has shown us his compassion. Um, also brought to mind because a few years ago, a friend was hunting for a biblical, biblical name for his son. And he came up with Jonah, uh, which actually means dove. So we might think of, you know, this is, oh, that's nice, a messenger of peace. But I had mentioned at the time, I said, well, you know, Jonah has some bad connotations that uh, sailors always referred to somebody as a Jonah who was kind of a jinx. Uh, and also <laughs> I said that if you read the book of Jonah, he's not the, the nicest guy in the world, but I think they were thinking more of uh, Jonah in the whale. But uh, despite that, the, he, he is, the son is named Jonah and he's, I'm sure he's going to be fine. <laughs> and it is a biblical name. Um, uh, and of course, the last thing of course that occurs to you is just thinking of, as a child growing up in the Bible stories we learned in Bible class, we always thought of Jonah and the whale. Uh, and if I was gonna title this lesson, I think I would title it Jonah and the Worm, that, uh, uh, that uh, is, is uh, perhaps significant in uh, part of the life of Jonah. The book of Jonah itself is short. It's only four chapters. I counted 39 verses. Uh, so it's a quick read anytime. Um, and uh, we uh, and it reminds us as we study Jonah and, and 
Caleb was referring to this this morning as we were looking at Isaiah, of the different personalities of the different prophets. And we see how God can use people that may not seem obvious choices to carry out his will. Um, we certainly see, in, uh, as, we, as we'll read the account of uh, Jonah, even though he has some good qualities, uh, he can be a man of action, although not necessarily the right actions. He can uh, uh, be willing to sacrifice himself for others. And uh, he is effective as a prophet in preaching his message. But on the other hand, he's someone who thinks he can flee the presence of the God, that you would think this would be something a prophet would be very aware of, that would be impossible to do. Uh, he has his own sense of justice and actually judges God. And then he can be uh, quite petulant and, and pouting at times when uh, things are not going uh, going his way. Um, and uh, so I'm going to skim quickly through the book. I'm not going to read every verse as we could. And of course, since I'm focusing primarily on the fourth chapter, um, I'll skim through the earlier. Hopefully you're familiar with the account. But first, looking at the first three verses of uh, Jonah chapter 1, uh, we see Jonah being called as a prophet and sent on his mission, uh, much as we saw in Isaiah 6 this morning in class. It says, The word of Jonah, the son of Amittai, or the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry against it, for their wicked wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. So he went down to Joppa, found a ship which was going to Tarshish, paid the fare, and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. So we see uh, Isaiah this morning, he, he's called, he says, basically he ends up saying, Hear my Lord, send me. <laughs> and here Jonah is called. Jonah doesn't argue with the Lord, but he takes off for the other end of the earth. Uh, Nineveh is the capital of Assyria, a brutal, ruthless, corrupt, immoral society that is to the northeast of where, uh, uh, when Jonah is called. So we see Jonah heading to Tarshish, which, according to commentary, uh, was believed to be near Gibraltar in Spain. So probably as far west as you could go. <laughs> so. Talk about doing the opposite. And the other thing you noticed, at least three times it says here that he's fleeing the presence of the Lord. And here again, you think someone who is called a prophet thinks God is only here where he's called, that the Lord isn't going to do anything about it when he uh, disobeys him. Uh, and then, of course, the familiar passage, uh, he, he does... It's interesting, he pays his fare. He's going to just be a passenger and go to uh, Tarshish. And then, of course, God uh, is not happy with this. He's going to teach a lesson to Jonah. Uh, he sends a wind, a great storm. Um, ship starts to break apart. The crew even jettisons their cargo, uh, you know, which is the purpose of their trip. And what is Jonah doing? Jonah is actually sleeping through all this. And it reminds you of uh, kind of the uh, Jesus on the Sea of Galilee when he was asleep and the apostles had to wake him to, uh, to calm the storm. Uh, but in this case, they wake him. The captain wakes him up and saying, what are you doing? Get up. Everyone's calling upon their gods to be saved. And here you're, you're doing nothing. Uh, which um, calls to mind for me when I first moved to Madison with my family as a teenager, there was an elder in the congregation, Al Milky, who used to tell a story about being on uh, a troop ship headed for the Normandy coast at D-Day. And he talked about, you know, being in his bunk. And he said all these men that uh, had cared less for God and um, were, you know, gambling and cursing and drinking and doing everything else, whatever they had a chance, were all in distress and you know calling their so 
scared, uh, all prey and whatnot. And he, someone actually grabbed him out of his bunk and said, what are you doing? You know, why aren't you out here praying with us? You know, we know you're a spiritual man. And of course, his reply to him, he said, well, I, you know, I pray every day and I'm, you know, and I'm at peace with God. You know, I pray and worship God. You know, it doesn't have to be a, a special circumstance. Uh, but anyway, they are calling upon God. Uh, Jonah doesn't immediately say, uh, hey, guys, I know why. <laughs> but uh, they do cast lots, and it turns out that uh, Jonah is the one that has caused the problem. Uh, and then at least here we see Jonah at, at, at least admitted to him and saying, to take care of this, you need to toss me overboard. Uh, and it's interesting because there's going to be a contrast which we see later, but the, the compassion and care for the crew, the crew actually still tries to row to safety, and they ask Jonah's God for forgiveness before tossing him overboard. Um, and, of course, he's tossed overboard. The, it, says, it says a great fish swallowed him, and then the seas calm. And then he spends three days and nights uh, within the, the stomach of the fish. Uh, and of course, it's interesting here, we know in the gospel accounts, they all mention the sign, that Jesus would be known by the sign of Jonah, the idea that he would be in, in the grave for uh, three days and three nights. Um, and of course, here we get into chapter 2 of Jonah, which is his prayer when he is actually in the stomach of the fish. So you can imagine... Uh, and, of course, it does say stomach uh, in the translation that you'd be in some place that would be dark, close. I mean, it would be like being in a grave. In addition to that, you'd have all these stomach acids working, you know, working upon you. So we can imagine what he might have looked like after, uh, you know, after he goes through all this. And, of course, it's a way of being buried. I mean, he's been in this fish's, fish's gullet, and we could imagine that any, anyone that's claustrophobic, he'd be um, certainly freaking out. Uh, but he does pray, and we have the, a prayer account, and he concludes with saying that uh, salvation is from the Lord. I mean, he does, you know, admit that, you know, he, things are completely in God's hands, and he humbles himself and submits himself. And, of course, he is saved in, a, in another messy manner. The fish vomits him out upon dry land. So you can think about what a humbling thing this has been, the terrors of being in the fish, but also being uh, part of fish vomit <laughs> that is thrown upon the land. So it would certainly uh, change your attitude. Um, and then here, again, uh, one thing the book does, it does like to repeat phrases, but with a purpose. But in uh, chapter 3, 1 through 5, we see uh, Jonah's call being repeated again. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and proclaim to it the proclamation which I'm going to tell you. So Jonah rose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three days walk. Then Jonah began to go through the city one day's walk, and he cried out and said, Yet forty days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Then the people of Nineveh believed in God, and they called a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. So this time when Jonah is called, what does he do? He goes. Uh, God has gotten gotten his attention, and, uh, and of course he's seen that, uh, uh, you know, God, God has saved him, even though he deserved destruction. And of course he's, he goes about preaching. You can't help but think that this time he's preaching with more conviction than he would have the first time he went, and, uh, and uh, he's certainly um, putting more energy into it. You can't help but think, too, that uh, I mentioned the stomach acid from being in the stomach, that you can't help but think, you know, was there something about his appearance? Uh, and the sailors who had thrown him overboard and seen the seas calm, 
uh, must have helped spread the story. And of course, the story might have uh, been with Jonah himself helping convince people to listen to his message. But the amazing thing is that uh, Jonah had fled, you know, then, and of course, part of the reason we think that it might have been he'd think no one would listen and he was afraid, although um, he says something else in chapter four. Um, but uh, we, do, uh, we do see the success of Jonah's prophecy and, and prophesying to the people. And so we look uh, further in chapters, uh, verses six through 10. Uh, when the word of the a word reached the king of Nineveh, he arose from his throne and set, laid aside his robe from him, covered himself with sackcloth and sat on the ashes. He issued a proclamation and said, in Nineveh, by the decree of the king and its nobles, do not let man, beast, herd, or flock taste a thing. Do not let them eat or drink water, but both man and beast must be covered with sackcloth. And let men call on God earnestly that each may turn from his wicked way and from the violence which is in his hands. Who knows, God may turn and relent and withdraw his burning anger so that we will not perish. When God saw their deeds that they turned from their wicked way, then God relented concerning the calamity which he had declared. He would bring up, uh, he would bring up on them and he did not do it. And of course we know when uh, Jonah was going about the streets of Nineveh. He was actually preaching their destruction because of all these things you have done in 40 days, you're going to be destroyed. Uh, but here the people and the rulers, rulers themselves humble themselves totally and put themselves in God's hands so that God actually does relent even though the message had been of their destruction. So now we have to see, uh, now what is Jonah's reaction? Is Jonah filled with joy because he's seen all these people repent and, and, pro and, and uh, proclaim that they're humbling themselves before God? Is he pleased that his, his ministry has been a success, that he's prophesied and the people have responded because we'll we'll see later it's supposed to be a city of 120,000 is he thankful to God for uh, you know being able to accomplish his will and and to uh, uh, accomplish his mission as a prophet and does he appreciate God's love and mercy when he does relent well when the people respond because of course if he would do this for the Syrians he certainly does this for the Israelites so anyway, let's see what he does <laughs> in uh, chapter four, verses one through five. But it did greatly displeased Jonah and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, please Lord, was not this what I said when I was still in my own country? Therefore, in order to forestall this, I fled to Tarshish. For I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness and one who relents concerning calamity. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for death is better than life. The Lord said, do you, have good re do you have good reason to be angry? Then Jonah went out from the city and sat east of it. There he made a shelter for himself and sat under it in the shade until he could see what happened to the city. So, so we see his action instead of you know, accepting God's, it's like he is angry. He's mad. He wanted to see Nineveh blasted after 40 days. And with the idea, part of it is, uh, like I said, this is a ruthless warlike people who plunder and pillage others. They're an enemy of Israel. Um, he was perhaps thinking that uh, this punishment would be a demonstration of God's power and other nations would... Uh, would respect uh, would would respect Israel. Uh, remind you of James and John, the the sons of thunder, when they wanted Jesus to call down fire from heaven 
on villages that refuse to receive them with the idea that, well, we're going to show God's power. Boom. You know, that, that, uh, uh, that uh, you know, how can you do this for people who have done so many things? And, of course, the, the, uh, the Ninevites have done many evil, evil things. Of course, you might think, too, of uh, after Paul had been a persecutor and then later uh, uh, becomes an apostle, that uh, how people might have looked at him, that they or their loved ones had suffered from what he had done in the past. It's very hard to accept that God could accept those that uh, you think are horrible. And of course, in this case, that uh, um, Jonah is actually setting himself up as a judge over God. He said, well, I mean, and, and, and of course, it's interesting, the, ex the excuse he gives for why he was fleeing to the side of the world. It wasn't because he's afraid or he's afraid of being killed. It's because he was afraid God wasn't going to kill all these people. He wasn't going to destroy them. And, uh, he's, and, and what a complaint. Um, uh, and then, then, of course, then you think of him as like a little kid. He sets up this shelter on the east side of the city and perches there because he's going to sit there. You think of someone that's probably sitting there pouting and petulant. So I'm going to wait till the 40 days and thinking, well, perhaps the people won't stick to their repentance. Perhaps just saying, well, God, I'm going to hold my breath until you do what you had me proclaim, until you wipe out this uh, people and show your power. Um, and actually, by his actions and what he says, that uh, um, Jonah is indicating he doesn't believe that God is just. He's also uh, uh, objecting to God's grace, mercy, and love, which is fantastic. How can you, especially someone who's, who's benefited from it, that he was saved from his ordeal with the whale when he was disobedient and deserved punishment. Uh, and of course, his first response to this too, well, basically, Lord, just kill me now. <laughs> it's like, I can't stand this. And, uh, and of course, we're going to see this repeated. But again, somebody who's God's prophet, and what is he want he, to kill for? He's just willing to die. It's because God won't blast somebody that he thinks should be, uh, should be wiped out and destroyed. Uh, it says something too that sometimes the uh, the God of the Old Testament is is presented as basically an angry God, just always looking to punish people. And of course, some people in the world today, their image of God is this old man in the sky, who just waiting to nail me with anything I do wrong or to uh, to punish people. But we see here that god is patient and loving in fact he's very patient with jonah because he continues to teach him lessons uh, i'm also reminded i don't know if any of you have read the the novel by c.s lewis called till we have faces but at the end of that one of the characters is questioning another and saying you know is god just because they felt like everything they'd gone through was unfair and the other character replies if god was just where would we all be with the idea that if God was just, we would all stand condemned. So we need to, uh, I mean, we need to realize that, you know, God has grace and mercy and that uh, it's for everyone. It's not just for me and then everybody else uh, should be punished uh, type thing. Um, so that uh, uh, in the end, the, uh, God produces another lesson for Jonah, so they're setting in his little shelter. Uh, and we'll read about this in verses 6 through 8. Uh, when the word, oops. So the Lord appointed a plant and it grew over Jonah to be a shade over his head to deliver him from his discomfort. And Jonah was extremely happy about the plant. But God appointed a worm when dawn came the next day, and it attacked the plant, and it withered. When the same came up, God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on Jonah's head so that he became faint and begged with all his soul to die, saying, Death is better than life. So here again, 
here again we have Jonah just kill me <laughs> and it's like it seemed like over you know a minor thing and and no one told him to go and sit in a shelter I mean he's sitting there basically waiting because he wants God to do what he thinks is right uh, but the idea here that God sends a vein that shelters him uh, from the sun of course he also sends a hot wind um, and and but it's uh, it's interesting the contrast what makes Jonah happy is he got the shade from this vine, and yet he's unhappy because people weren't destroyed, you know. But, but anyway, the minor things. Um, and then, of course, God the next day sends a worm to destroy the, uh, uh, destroy the vine. And again, Jonah is, well, just kill me because I lost this, uh, this vine. And it's a reminder to us, I was thinking of that the other day, I'd gone out to eat with someone and it's like, oh, this is a good meal and we're having a good time. And then there's a fly and the fly was, just, you know, none of us could hit the fly that <laughs> kept annoying us. Or times when you've been outside and it's just beautiful outside and there's a mosquito. But it seems like there's always some little thing that can distract us and it can be another person at work or at school or a family member. <laughs> but, I mean, it's something like, the, you know, we get distracted by little things that uh, in, instead of focusing on the, the big picture and the, the many blessings that God does, does give us. Uh, so let's go ahead and finish uh, and read verses 9 through 11. Then God said to Jonah, do you have good reason to be angry about the plant? And he said, I have good reason to be angry, even to death. Then the Lord said, you had compassion on the plant for which you did not work and which you did not cause to grow, which came up overnight and perished overnight. Should I not have compassion on Nineveh, the great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who not, do not know the difference between their right and left hand, as well as many animals? So again, when uh, the Lord talks to him, and he's, uh, the sun has come up and he's miserable in the heat, he's angry enough to die. I mean, this is like three times. It's just kill me. I'm, um, and the Lord points out to him that he has more concern over this vine than he does 120,000 people. And how many times do we sometimes see ourselves with that? It's easy to... Uh, not care about things that are not known to us, but the little, the little things around us can uh, uh, make us very angry and bitter and upset and and uh, cranky with others. Um, and of course, uh, at the end here, we never see the rest of the story. Hopefully, Jonah learns from this and goes on his way. But uh, uh, we're kind of left with him setting in this in the sun angry again saying lord just kill me but again throughout the story we've seen god so patient we might also wonder why is jonah chosen as a, a prophet of god i mean with his his attitude uh, but again it points out that over and over again in the scripture god chooses weak vessels to accomplish his will and it's something to remind us too. Sometimes we say, well, I don't have the skills. I don't have the abilities that someone else does, or I don't have, I've got some really bad character traits, <laughs> but God can use us uh, wherever we're at if we uh, admit to it. And of course, if Jonah had tried to, to look at the bigger picture and hope, hopefully eventually he did, he would have uh, uh, appreciated what God had done for him. Uh, and of course, another big lesson that's always pointed from Jonah is that you can't flee the presence of God. And so many times in our lives, we seem to think that, well, if we're not at church or we're not around fellow Christians or we're alone, somehow God doesn't see us. He doesn't see the things that we do. I mean, we get a, a you know, a, a chance to um, cheat or badmouth someone or, or, uh, uh, do some other commit commit some sin and it's like oh well god's god's not watching me now so i can get away with this or 
Um, and, and of course, again, uh, in the case of Jonah, we still can't believe that here is someone who's a prophet of God that can think he's fleeing the presence of God. If he can do that, what about us? <laughs> we, can, we can certainly do that in our daily lives. Uh, a lesson, too, that, as we mentioned before, that we learned from this that God is patient, merciful, and loving. And he, we have seen this throughout the Bible, Old Testament and New, New Testament. And that uh, uh, we need to accept this. Uh, and, of course, I think most of us would not question like Jonah did when God is loving and merciful to someone else. But, you know, perhaps there might be at times that we feel like there are certain people that should be punishment or they shouldn't be accepted as, as brothers or sisters in Christ because of perhaps things that have gone on in their past. Or we want to condemn a whole country or a whole people just because what some have done and don't look at people is that God is, is, is loving everyone and is uh, wanting all people to come into his kingdom. Uh, and of course, at the, at the end of the, uh, the book of Jonah, we see that uh, a reminder is God is trying to teach Jonah that we need to show compassion to others just as God shows compassion to us. That uh, it's kind of like we see with Jonah, he's saved from the whale, but he turns around and he, that seems to go out the window, that he, what he had done something too that deserved condemnation and then to, uh, uh, and, and of course it's hard to, be, sometimes when we're feeling miserable or irritated or isolated, it's hard to show compassion for others. And then finally, that uh, overall you'd see with this is that uh, as an example with the vine, <laughs> The good things that we have come from God, and sometimes we have what we think is great job, great great relationships, uh, great health, things like this that we start taking for granted. And one of some of the things when some of these things are changed are challenged by pandemics or uh, inflation or other things that suddenly, uh, you know, we're very upset. We're not thinking of all the things that we do have. Uh, that we need to count our blessings, not to uh, dwell on the wrongs that are done to us or the setbacks or physical challenges of this life. But um, look at the things that, that, uh, that we do have. And, uh, yeah, and, of course, continually look at the spiritual blessings that we have through Christ, that we are not bound. This life is not the only thing that we have that we need to be looking looking at eternity not looking at the, the daily life so anyway i hope these words have helped re help us in refocusing i'd encourage you at times to read jonah as i said it's only four chapters but also to think that uh, uh and i think one of the songs kayla's going to be leading is count your many blessings but uh, the idea that we do have so many blessings we need to be concerned with sharing with others and we need to be continually uh, reaching out with others and perhaps helping people look past their infirmities and and challenges they're facing in their lives and at this time Kay will come and lead us Our song for our partaking of the communion will be number 528 in the book. Number 528. And yes, just as was preached wonderfully this morning, we have to realize that all blessings come from God. That we can pass along those blessings in our own lives and to others, but ultimately the, our blessings all come from God. So let us sing, let us worship the Lord and thank him. <clears throat> Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy
We were commanded the first day of every week to participate in this memorial service to remember the sacrifice that was made on our behalf that we might have salvation. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord our God, we thank you for this day you've given us and the opportunity that we can come here as a family and worship you, Lord. As we get ready, Lord, to partake of this bread, let us remember that it represents the body of your Son, who freely gave it on our behalf. It is through him. Amen. Let us continue. <clears throat> Lord, for as long as there was time, you always had a plan, and that plan always involved sacrifice, sacrifices of blood. Beginning, it involved animals, but that wasn't good enough. So you required the perfect sacrifice, the blood of the perfect and the clean, the blood of your son. And as he hung on the cross and died for us, he became that perfect sacrifice. And as we partake of this fruit of the vine, let us remember that it represents that blood, that perfect sacrifice that gives us an opportunity at salvation. It is through him. Amen. As we continue in worship this morning, we'll be singing number 500 in the book. Number 500. Oh, thou fount of every blessing. Oh, thou fount of every blessing, to my heart to sing thy praise. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of Six sixty three in the book. Six sixty three. Not that one. A little bit further. There, there it is. Six sixty three. There is sunshine in my soul. A song about being happy that we are blessed, but also being happy that others are blessed. Seeing the goodness in all blessings. <clears throat> there is sunshine in my soul today. More glorious and bright.
song that was spoke of in the sermon. Number 118 in the book. <clears throat> sometimes, yeah, we miss the point that we are very blessed, and so sometimes we have to stop and think about the many blessings that we have in life. Oh. Yeah, you're going to need to have them open the book. Oh, yeah, okay, cool. Gotcha. So, you won't have a slide, but if you'll turn in your hymnals to page 118... Number 118, count your blessings. <clears throat> Number 118. <clears throat> when upon life's billows you are tempest tossed, when you are discouraged, thinking all is lost, count your many blessings, name them one by one. Money cannot buy you. 
631, sorry, 631, if you're able, let's stand for our final song, 631, the Lord bless you and keep you, I've visited so many churches that have not sung this song, but simply read this song at the end of every service as a, almost a going out, the Lord bless you and keep you, make his face to shine upon you as you head out into the world, away from the Christian family, but as a comfort to you to know that the Lord is always there with us. So let us close out with the Lord bless you and keep you. <clears throat> It has been very good to be gathered here this morning to worship God. Let's remember to make it a complete day of worship by giving of our means. There's four different ways to take care of that this morning, and I encourage you to take advantage of one of those. Thank you, Hans, for the lesson that you brought for us. Uh, very meaningful and very appropriate for us. Thank you very much. Let's go to God in prayer. Our gracious and loving and long-suffering God in heaven, we thank you so much for your love for us. We thank you for the blessings that you pour out on us each day. We pray, Father, that we will always remember to give you the glory for these things and not take these things for granted. Help us, Father, to show our joy and love uh, out in the world each day. Help us to show the hope that lives with us, within us uh, through your Son who came and uh, gave his life as the perfect sacrifice for our sins. Help us, Father, to always uh, strive to do your will. Help us to have the wisdom and courage to search out the truth of your word and apply it in our lives each day. Thank you, Father, so much again for all the blessings, but most of all for that uh, precious gift of your son who came and uh, paid the price for all of us. It's in his precious name we pray. Amen.